everyone and welcome to Rad Chat, the multi-award winning therapeutic radio for led oncology podcast. My name is Joe McNamara and I'm joined by fellow host Norman Jo Anderson. Hi everyone. So we're hugely grateful for our next guest who has just sat and uh, eaten a really nice vegan burger. <laughs> it looks really, really good. It's actually very tasty. You can notice the eating. So we're here at UKIO. Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi everybody, my name's Emma Rose. I'm a diagnostic radiographer at Great Ormond Hospital for Children in London um, and I work in pediatric interventional radiology and I'm an advanced practitioner so I place lines for chemotherapy for treatment, I do feeding tube changes and esophageal dilatations as my advanced clinical practice. What made you want to go into radiography? <coughs> well, good to <laughs> background story linked to UKO. So I actually used to do events and I used to run big events like oh, this right. um, and be part of like where they set up the stands. So I'm getting a lot of flashbacks actually being yeah. at UKO <laughs> of all of the drama behind the scenes when parts has been missing and different things like that. And um, I went for a job interview. I did a biology degree while I did events and then I went for a job interview in events where it finished with him offering a careers advice book right. and I definitely didn't get the job um, <laughs> and then I thought about going to the NHS and I'd actually never heard of radiography until I was 22 never even heard of it at school wasn't something that was ever talked about in the careers fairs at school and so I just went on NHS jobs because I vaguely thought about being a paramedic and I really wanted to combine like the two worlds so on my biology degree, I did a year in industry where I worked in a laboratory and did toxicology testing. I loved it. It was the year that Lip Vinyenko got poisoned, and right. we had some really cool things where they at first thought it was a different type of metal poisoning that we tested for, and then when they realised it was radiation, we had to be like come and be tested to see if we were radioactive as well. It was really cool. But on the other hand, I did events, which was all people, people, like negotiating, and I wanted to find the mix of the well as like the science and the people. So radiography seemed to hit, tick all the boxes and I applied and very quickly was doing it six weeks later. Much to my parents' disgust that I hadn't actually finished one degree and then I was already going on to another <laughs> one to say, the eternal student, but I've never looked back, I love it. So I'm very lucky. Why peas? I love pediatrics because there is never a more honest patient. They, Aww. you know, they can be the sickest sickest person in the vicinity and they'll still smile they'll still laugh you know I think adults get a lot of pajama syndrome don't they where they I mean I feel very sorry for myself when I'm sick <laughs> whereas children just don't do that and they're always smiling and laughing and I think that you know they, the stuff they come out with and the you know they'll tell you if they're agreeing with you they'll tell you and you see so many range of patients from the tiny babies to teenagers that tell you to insert a swear word and go you know go off and you know it's it's just so lovely to be able to help someone's loved one I've got a lot of friends with children and I know that you you know when the parents say to you like who's the look after them we will and because it's it's their precious thing in the world and it's our job to help look after them so yeah I do love pediatrics. What's the most challenging aspect of your role do you think? I think sometimes especially in a tertiary referral centre we get some horrible, really sad cases that, you know, we see the really rare, world rare cases, um, like conjoined twins and all of the really things like that, and I think particularly oncology, yeah. when we get the oncology kids through, I think when they're, we're doing a biopsy and their tube, you can see it coming out of their stomach almost, because they grow so quickly when they're paediatric patients often, and that can be upsetting, if we think about it for too long, it can be really upsetting to know that, like, that child might not make it and yeah. that that's going to really affect that family and what they're about to go through if they're about to go for BMT or to have horrible chemotherapy and all of the trauma that that's going to cause on their families and like often when they come to us for a biopsy or a line that's their first anaesthetic so for that family you just see the parents in the corridor like you know so upset and that's the first time that the parents are allowed to be upset because their their child isn't there and they can be really brave and then they kind of get upset once the kind of yeah. need just takes over and that can be really hard to see and it, it does affect some of us sometimes when we're, we just have to remember that that's the worst day of their lives, the worst day of their lives, even though it's routine for us. So I think that can be one of the hardest parts. Emma, how do you not take something like this home? It's actually something that I think we probably do take home. I don't think it's easy to turn that off. 
one of our radiographers actually is doing her um, pre-doctoral research into exactly that, particularly to do around with um, suspected physical abuse cases and that kind of um, trauma. We do a lot of um, forensic imaging and how we do take that home, I think. And I think it's really important to have a support network at work that understands. Obviously, you should always advocate drinking, but I think sometimes having that glass of wine after work and talking about it and being able to put it to bed really helps you then not take it home to your non-NHS family and friends. And I think that that's quite important. Um, and I think just knowing deep down that we're doing our best for that patient at that time, like even if they're not going to have a great outcome, even if they're having the most terrible day ever, we're doing our part to try and help their process. I think, especially in interventional radiology, we're the forgotten modality a lot of the time. And, you know, we see pictures on social media of patients ringing the bell, and no one really remembers that actually they couldn't have had their chemotherapy if I hadn't put their hip line in, and our team hadn't have done that. But we're a crucial part of so many patients' journeys, and I think you just have to remember that that's, we play a really critical role, and that kind of helps you process it a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about the interventions? So I'm just thinking sure. for maybe some student radiographers who yeah. just aren't maybe necessarily aware or have seen, especially within paediatrics, yeah. that field of care. So if we focus on oncology patients, I guess as a bracket, I mean, we see so many different types of patients, but oncology particularly, we can do a range of procedures. So biopsy is the big one. So um, we do core needle biopsy, and that's become really prevalent, especially in paediatrics. The alternative would be surgical biopsy, so you would, you know, make a big incision, take a chunk out, put them back together, and that's a big operation, big blood loss. Whereas we just put a biopsy needle in, which is about, it looks a bit like a sewing needle, yeah. and then take a core, and then, so that's much better recovery time, and they can get a really good diagnosis from that. From the next stage of their journey, and sometimes at the same time as the biopsy, we'll put a line in. Now, what type of line they get depends on the protocol that they'll be on and what type of treatment they're going to be having. But a line essentially is a way of giving like nasty drugs centrally. So they're actually the proper term would be centrally as access device. Um, our centrally as access team leader would be very cross at me calling it a line. It's, it's not a line, it's a CBC. Um, but people know them as lines. And they come in different forms. And it means that instead of giving chemotherapy peripherally, which could really be sore, it could be very painful, they can give it centrally into a bigger blood vessel, which means that all the kind of toxic drugs can flow freely and cause less damage and be more reliable to use. Yeah. It also stops, especially children, being cannulated every time because no one likes to be cannulated, adults or children, so that helps prevent that as well. Um, we do some venous access if children are then going into radiotherapy. We're not a radiotherapy centre, but they'll need to give them a general anaesthetic every day. Yeah. So we put in a pit line, which is one of those in the arm, um, so that they can give the drugs for the anaesthetic every day with minimal trauma to the child. And again, so that they don't, you know, we don't want to cause any long term trauma in terms of PTSD or any kind of um, long lasting anxiety. So we do that. Um, one fact that I love that blows my mind is that a Hickman line, so it's Mr. Hickman, Dr. Yeah. Hickman, that made it. Um, didn't exist until like 1972 or something. So I find it really crazy that like if my mum had had childhood cancer, she wouldn't have had, she'd have had to have the nasty peripheral chemotherapy. So I don't feel like that's that long ago, really. I know it was like 40 odd years ago, but in my head it blows my mind that that's a relatively near invention. Yeah. And it's ever changing. Like we now also offer cryoablation as a service, which is really new and up and coming. It's much bigger in adult oncology. And it's where you sort of put these needles or probes in and then you make an ice ball at the end and that's really good for certain types of tumours and you sort of freeze it essentially and it kills off the cancerous tissue so that's a really up and coming part of what we do and what we can offer now. Um, I don't think what else we do. Feeding tubes is a big one. If people are having particularly nasty treatment they might get mucositis and not be able to swallow and eat quickly or get enough nutrition. So we place feeding tubes so they can be fed straight into their stomach and it helps them um, get the nutrition that they need. I never realised it was so diverse. Yeah, we have we have a lot. Yeah. We do so many procedures like yeah, that's just the oncology based ones. Yeah. There's so many other procedures that we do for vascular anomalies, for congenital issues, like esophageal issues, we do dilatations, we do 
supports for all kinds of metabolic symptoms like syndromes and um, yeah there's wow. loads I can't even remember what it is, but yeah, I guess. How do you explain the procedures to the kids? That is something that I like to practice actually. I I personally think it's really important to include the children in the discussion. I don't think it's fair to ignore them, even if they're three or four. Um, our consent forms work that there is a little box, even on the under 16 forms, for the child to sign. And I really enjoy saying, would you like to write your name on? And they're like, <gasps> And I'm like, well, it's your body, and you were listening. Even if we know that they're not going to understand what I was actually talking about, they were listening, they were in the room. And I think it's really important that they're invested in their own healthcare journey. Um, and I like to just try and describe things. I don't know, I guess we have our own weird language that we adopt. But when I'm talking about a dilatation, for example, I talk about stretching it. And one of the risks of perforation, so if we stretch it too much, then it, it could get a hole in it. And the way I try and describe it is I'm like, you know, if you blow a balloon up too much, sometimes it will pop. And you have to kind of find something that they can relate to. When we talk about risk generally as well, and I copied this off an anaesthetist, one thing I like to say is that we're talking about things that might happen, and my job is I have to tell you legally what might happen, but you also have a risk every time you cross the road, or every time you um, eat some chicken. You know, like there's, there's always a risk to anything we do in life, and I like you kind of have to put it into context because some of the risks are scary like, yeah. and they are really, really, really rare but we have the duty to tell the families but I really like involving them in their care and being able to get them to write their name and it, it never had a bad response when I've asked them to do it and I don't think many people do do it so I like to make sure that they can write their name on the form that's what the box is there for so, so Emma, I don't know if you've ever listened to Holly Roberts' episode No, I haven't so, Holly Roberts, uh, we're a big fan of her charity yeah. called Larson's Pride. Oh, I've um, heard of Larson's yeah. Pride, yes. So yes. Um, it'll be great to connect you. You yeah. can do some amazing things. But um, she was obviously talking about her son Larson, who was an oncology patient. Yeah. And um, she's a big advocate for awake procedures yes. uh, versus using anaesthetic. Yeah. So is that something that you also try to adopt? It, you know, where, yeah. at what point do you go, no, we're definitely going to be a size patient? such a good question because it's such a fine balance and it really depends on the patient. Yeah. We do about 80% of our procedures under anaesthetic and about 20% right. awake. And our awake that procedures... Sounds like, that sounds quite a big stat, really. Aren't yeah, I'm, some of them we, we don't do. So in adult centres, if you were having a hip and line put in, you'd be awake from yeah. I've only ever seen one or two of it is done awake. Um, part of it is around instruction following. So yeah. when you put a line in, there's a risk that you would introduce air into the into the blood system, yeah. and you don't want that to happen. So in adults, you ask the patient to hold their breath, but you'd always be worried with children, depending on their age and their understanding, that they wouldn't follow your instruction, and therefore they'd be more at risk if you did something like that. We do do a lot of our feed and tube changes awake, and we do a lot of pick lines, which is the one that goes in the arm awake. Um, and some renal biopsies we can do awake as well so we do try however we also have some children that end up getting quite traumatised by that and it's a really fine balance I've got a few patients in my head that I can think of that we do the procedure awake because we know that it is better for them in terms of not having to be staffed for the anaesthetic it's better for the family situation of coming in and coming out and not spending three days in hospital but we have to balance that with risk to them and also we really have to think about psychological risk. Yeah. There's a brilliant team that originated at Red Woman Street who run the Poems course, which stands for Procedural Outcome Experience Management Strategy. Oh, I'm Don't impressed. Don't on that if I've got it wrong. <laughs> um, and that is an, an anaesthetic practitioner who actually does um, hypnotism and things. He's amazing. He's like our king of anxious patients and too many tests. Yeah. And I think that you can compare anaesthetic terror with procedural stuff quite easily. And they do all of these things about looking into strategies to help children do things awake and how to manage them. We use the play specialists a lot as well. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they magically make a patient that wasn't compliant compliant. It's some kind of weird voodoo magic that they do. I don't know. But it's amazing what they can manage. And I actually think, as radiographers, we're quite good at that, actually, because I started an x-ray and x-raying the children and doing CTs and things, like minimally invasive, non-invasive, 
And actually, I think radio officers, we are part lay specialists in paediatric centres, and I think that we do have this, that's our skill set as RADS, in adults, in therapy, and diagnostic, that we be with the patient for about 10 seconds, and we're asking them to take their top off for an x-ray, and I think that actually our core communication ability is that we can form a report really quickly, it's like innate in our abilities, and I think that actually we're very good at that. So I think we work really well as a team to try and put the patient at ease, but some children, there's also a key age group about three to nine where they, they, they understand enough to be scared, but they don't understand enough to kind of get through that, yeah. as it were. So they're kind of a core group that do get quite scared, that kind of primary school age. Can I ask, do you, do you find sometimes that just because of, and I'm not sure how it is with Great Northern Street, but just in terms of workforce, yeah. actually sometimes it is just speed in terms of, you know, there isn't, there isn't enough staff, we haven't got enough time to maybe invest in play therapy, yeah. and so giving general anaesthetic and doing the procedure with them. I don't think that happens because general anaesthetic always takes longer. Right, okay. Because honestly, the prep and the organisation yeah. and getting the team ready and getting the ward to do the pre checklist and put Ted's stockings on and all yeah. of those kind of things honestly takes longer. It's definitely okay. quicker to do away procedures generally. Yeah. There's always going to be an anomaly, but generally it is quicker. And we're going to have to wrap up, but yeah. can you give us a, a top tip for people listening to take away from your episode? <laughs> Uh, watch Peppa Pig if you want to work with children. <laughs> it's been my top tip. They all know it. I see this in all my lectures I ever give. Like, you put a picture of Georgia, and I'm like, who is this? And everyone says Peppa. I'm like, nope. And every three year old will tell you that, that is the wrong one. So, watch Peppa Pig if you want to work with children. Oh, that's what I think. Thank First you. First top tip we've ever had like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.